You're about to join Jerry Parker, Marit Siebert, and Niels Kostrup Larsen on their raw and honest journey into the world of systematic investing and learn about the most dependable and consistent yet often overlooked investment strategy. Welcome to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. Welcome or welcome back to this week's edition of the Systematic Investor Series with Richard Brennan and I, Niels Kastorblasen, where each week we take the pulse of the global market through the lens of a rules-based investor. Now, for those of you who are regular listeners, our conversations are intended to give you as much of the nurture and encouragement as the turtles got back in the 1980s, as Jerry likes to put it. And if you're new to the show, we hope that today's episode will trigger your appetite to learn more by diving into the back catalog and listen to all of the past episodes that you may have missed, like last week's episode with Mark, where we discussed how trend followers overcome uncertainty and reasons for and against overriding your models. But let me also invite you to listen to the conversation I released on Friday with Professor Steve Furster, who, together with Professor Andrew Lowe, wrote a great book called In Pursuit of of the perfect portfolio, which we discussed, of course, and you may find it interesting what Steve had to say when I asked him towards the end, if trend following is indeed the perfect portfolio. Rich, great to have you back on the show this week. How are you doing? How are things going down under? I'm recovering, Neil. So after the Black Friday episode, my battleship is up on the slips and it's getting major holes repaired. Good. Well, we'll get to the battleship in a second for sure. I'm I'm just glad to hear that it's not a submarine by now, but there we are. <laughs> so, uh, and by the way, we've got a great line of, uh, of questions, um, and not least that Rich has uh, brought along uh, this week. And before I forget, of course, I should mention that to all of you that um, the whole crew at Systematic Investor, we are going to get together on a what I hope will be an epic recording later this month in a couple of weeks. So if you have burning questions for any of us that you want us to um, battle out on the show, then uh, you need to email them to me as soon as possible. And the email is, as usual, info at toptradersunplugged.com. I also want to give a shout out, as usual, to those of you who left a rating and review on Apple Podcast. We are really grateful for uh, these reviews, and it certainly always gives us an extra level of motivation to produce the best content we can for you. And we hope you're enjoying also the extra midweek episodes that we have been able to provide you with. So for those of you who are still, um, you know, still need to leave a rating and review, so to speak, just head over to toptradersonplot.com forward slash review TTU and you can find all of the instructions. Now, let me give you a quick market wrap for this week. Trading this week was, of course, dominated by Chairman Powell's sudden hawkishness and the November jobs report. Headline numbers for non-farm payrolls came in as well below or well below expectation, registering 210,000 jobs versus consensus expecting 531,000 jobs. The statistic is based on a survey of businesses and the Bureau of Labor also releases an employment measure based on a survey of households. And that measure actually showed a gain of 1.1 million new jobs in the month, significantly above expectations. And the polar opposite of the non-farm payroll uh, result. And moreover, perhaps the household report showed that 594,000 persons re-entered the uh, workforce as well. Uh, And as a result, the unemployment rate uh, plunged to 4.2%, down from 6.3% in January of this year. So uh, down quite a lot so far this year. And of course, well below the 14.8% registered in April of 2020. So based on that report, either the economy is slowing and we can expect to be back at trend growth or its rapid growth is showing no sign of slowing. If the latter is is true, supporting growth acceleration argument was the Institute of Supply Manager Services survey that came out this week and that registered at 69.1 and that's an all-time record. The falling unemployment rate and the above expectation in terms of inflation has not been lost on the Fed. Virtually every speaker this week, including Powell, struck a very hawkish tone. Um, And reading between the lines of their comments, it's highly likely, I think, that the rate of tapering will be accelerated at the December 15th FOMC meeting. In addition, the markets, according to the Fed Fund's futures, 
are betting that the first Fed fund rate hike will occur in by March 2022, so only in a few months, with two hikes in 2022 and another two in 2023. Now, stocks have not reacted well to the prospect of early rate hikes and the S&P falling nearly 5% since November 20th. Now, bond traders, on the other hand, they are delighted with this prospect. The two-year, 30-year yield curve spread has fallen um, to 109 basis points from 229 basis points earlier this year. And uh, if you take a page out of the bond traders playbook, traders flatten the curve when the Fed becomes hawkish in anticipation that the rate hikes will dampen inflation. But it's probably too soon to assume that Powell and company will have the stomach to fight inflation to the degree that will be needed. Meanwhile, by the way, uh, the debt ceiling has not been raised and Janet Yellen is saying that the US will run out of cash by mid-December. And if you put all of that together, December is looking to shape up to another interesting month. Now, that was a long market wrap, Rich. I want to bring you in. I want to hear about what's caught your attention market-wise, performance-wise. We need to get a, an update on the repair sh- job at the on the battleship. How are things? Yes, well, it, it was a, a big week on Friday. And I remember most of the market moves were occurring when I was listening to Jerry's Clubhouse. So I blame Jerry indirectly for the entire market move. But I think we can be confident that the reason for the the shock event was the Omicron virus. And we recognise that these these events that we've been having, for instance, in March 2020 and um, on Black Friday, are what we regard as these exogenous events that lie outside the financial system. So when they impact, they impact across all asset classes. And this is this is where uh, trend followers, as perfect as we are, when we have these large diversified trend following portfolios, we don't like it when all of those um, those return streams become super correlated. And this is what I found on Friday night, where everything became correlated. So most of the trends I was riding, and I've been writing them for, you know, some of them a year or more, they all just um, disappeared. So everything headed down to the trailing stop. Um, and in terms of my drop in equity, I was I was quite literally hammered from all sides. So my battleship was sort of reeling with holes in it. It looked like uh, I needed a lot of cork to, um, to, to repair all of the holes in my battleship. So it, it is currently on the slips at the moment getting repairs as I'm needing a, a, a good vacation with a martini watching my battleship being repaired. But in the meantime, there have been a few things that have stayed on. The, the coffee trend has stayed on for me, which is great. My Aussie dollar decline, I've, I've been sort of short the Aussie dollar, and that's had a, a nice short move, uh, which I'm capitalising on, and the euro dollar uh, also short. But And the NASDAQ has been able to hold on despite the hiccup on on Black Friday. It, it wasn't as severely hit as the, the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones. So I was able to hold on to um, the the NASDAQ. But apart from those boys now, um, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's repair mode for me. Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, the same story on, uh, on our side, really, we had a rough finish to November, thanks to this new COVID scare. And, um, you know, we're pretty much back to flat for the year now. And, um, you know, there was a bit of follow through this week, of course, uh, as energies and equities continue to be under pressure. But uh, in reality, pretty much all markets that we trade went against us in the last uh, 10 days or so. And um, that's just how it is. Um, and as frustrating as as it can be, uh, which is, you know, that side of trend following, um, it is not something we haven't seen before. And and certainly it's um, something that, you know, and I, and I base that on 47 years of track record. Uh, and, uh, and it's not going to be the last time, of course. These things do happen. Um, on the volatility side of uh, of our uh, programs, um, it really handled Thanksgiving a lot better and actually made a bit of money on Black Friday. Um, so that was really nice to see because often I tell investors that, you know, they look to invest in strategies that can help protect the overall portfolio. And a strategy like our volatility program will do much better in terms of the initial phase of uh 
of a reversal, so to speak, or the beginnings of a big event, uh, without a doubt, where trends suddenly change direction. And um, and often what happens is, of course, as you said, it's a, it's a sell-off in, in all risk assets at the same time. Um, but in addition, we know that you need to have this core allocation to trend following because it has demonstrated time and time again that that is by far the best strategy in providing protection when you go through a prolonged crisis like the tech bubble or the great financial crisis. So the two play quite nicely uh, together. Now, just looking at this week, and I want to mention that as well, it's because it, it is actually quite interesting, especially if you if you look in, in, in kind of the volatility space at the moment. Uh, so we had the S&P bouncing back and forth with some pretty big lo- you know, losses and gains on a daily basis. And so the realized volatility in the S&P uh, this week was you know, around 26% on an annualized basis for the last five trading days. Now, that's still quite low or relatively low compared to the VIX index. That jumped above 30 um, and actually exceeded 35 on Friday. And this is in a week where the S&P only declined 1.2%. Usually that doesn't catch a lot of attention, um, but the VIX levels reached during this week were really historically um, and, and normally only reserved for deep economic uh, or financial crises. So with the exception of 2008, and 2020, those two crises, in total, there were only 51 days with higher VIX index uh, closes, um, higher than 35. And those days were made up events by, uh, such as the flash crash in 2010, uh, the European debt crisis in 2011, Volmageddon, of course, in February 2018, also the tapering fears we saw in, in December of 2018. So, it's very interesting to see the effect that uh, it's having on on this level of uncertainty in the market, something actually which will be quite relevant for our conversation uh, today. But it's kind of hard to tell if it's uncertainty around Omicron, if it's the Fed tapering, is it the non-farm payrolls? Um, but what we can see in the market, certainly in the volatility markets, that you're really now down to two very distinct groups of participants there are no people in the middle. It kind of feels like exactly the same that's going on in this whole vaccine debate, frankly. So um, so that's interesting. Now, when we look at my own trend following uh, portfolio, that was also quite interesting. So I want to go back to November first because it's it's an interesting month to review. So first of all, the program as a whole was down a little bit, 1.58% in November. That brings the year-to-date at the end of November to plus 6.45. But what was interesting to me is when you break it down by model group performance because both group one and two, which are medium-term trend-following models, were down about 2.3% and 4.53% respectively in November. But if you remember from our previous conversations, when we designed the program, we also included what we call group three models, which we think about or when with you know when it was designed back in 2006 2007 we thought about it as kind of a plunge protection team because we know what the weakness of trend following is it, you know we you know we just talked about it and your battleship right we know that that happens from time to time so we designed these group 3 models to be the plunge protection team so to speak so when something really big happens they should engage and hopefully uh, dampen the uh, the blow And so what happened on Black Friday for the model was exactly that. So the program ended up making money on Black Friday, 0.65%. So that was purely down to the Group 3 models coming in um, and doing really well. And for the month as a whole, those Group 3 models made 5.24%. And that's why the monthly loss were pretty small. So that makes a big difference on a day like that, in a month like that. If we include then the last few days and we look at it as the close of business uh, Friday, it was a small positive week. And for the month of November, December, which is only a couple of days, it's it's up four basis points, nothing much. And it's up 6.5% year to date. But what I wanted to do today was instead of looking at month to date numbers, because there's only two trading days, 
I'm going to zoom out and just look at what's going on in terms of year to date, so 2021 uh, so far. And group one models, classical trend models, are down a fraction, down about 85 basis points. So nothing, you know, big there. The group two models, which have a long bias, they're really pulling uh, the, 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 the load this year. They're up 6.7%. And then group three models, which I said, they're really mainly there to make money when you need it, but they're still a slight positive contribution so far this year, up 75 basis points. Now, in terms of sectors so far this year, the top three are base metals, energies and bonds, and the worst three this year are currencies, precious metals, and short-term interest rates. In terms of single markets so far this year, uh, aluminum, Swiss market index, and the US 10-year notes are the top three. And the bottom three this year are DAX, the euro, so the currency, but also the euro dollar, the short-term interest rates. And in terms of where we are in the risk to stop measure that, uh, that I look at, the portfolio would lose 7% if it got stopped out of everything. And that's pretty much unchanged from a week ago when I spoke with Mark. So that's where we are on things. That's where we are on my battleship, so to speak. Now we're going to jump to, uh, well, we're going to jump to some of your topics, uh, Rich. But before we get to that, this is a kind of a selfish question that I need your thoughts on. And um, what we've discussed and, and the whole theme this week about Black Friday, it's kind of reminded me uh, that these events, they do happen and we get these big negative spikes in terms of performance. Or it could be just over a couple of months but where performance is, you know, is, is, is pretty bad in the trend following space. Now, for me, it's always interesting that when trend following tends to go on sale, so to speak, we find ourselves in a and, and and we find ourselves in a meaningful drawdown. It really should be the time for investors to start to lean into the strategy because, in some ways, you can say that it's a time where the strategy is "quote unquote" cheap. Now, clearly, that does not mean that we couldn't have a deeper drawdown because we don't really know, and drawdowns which we'll come to are quite difficult to forecast. Uh, to to be fair, but I've noted over the years that. This is something that investors feel incredibly uncomfortable about. I mean, you need courage to do something like that. And, and it feels very difficult, almost impossible for investors to, to take that leap of faith and buy into these drawdowns. So what I'm interested in is, is your thoughts on, on this. And let me just, yeah, I'll come back with some, some maybe some more insights. But just generally speaking, your thoughts on buying into a drawdown why it's so difficult and maybe even you found ways yourself to uh, overcome that. Yes. So it's a very interesting topic because when uh, we typically talk about trend following on, on the podcast, we, we, we say that, yes, trend following is something that um, uh, we can teach people to do themselves or trend following is something that an investor can allocate money towards. So there are two forms of attacking trend following, do it yourself or allocate towards. Now, I think there is a, a bit of an opportunity with investors that choose to allocate to trend following because for trend followers themselves who operate their systems, they don't know when those drawdowns are going to occur, but they do know that the characteristics of their equity curve over the long term is going to be quite highly volatile. And they will know that there'll be periods where we get into quite deep drawdowns. Now, that volatile nature of that equity curve does prevent some timing issues in relation to investment opportunities for people that want to allocate money towards. Now, if you're trading a model yourself, you don't have this benefit of being able to, for instance, buy the dip by buying into a drawdown because you're committed to your models and you don't know what it's going to give you. But if you're an investor allocating towards trend following models, and you are confident in that that investment manager or that trend following manager, the perfect time to be investing in trend following is when it's in drawdown. And you don't have to be picking the bottom of those drawdowns exactly, because really, um, if you are progressively investing over the course of time, I'd be saying only invest in these periods of drawdown. In other words, be selective at the timing of entry into these trend following programs. I said, provided, of course, there's the 
proviso that they are robust trend following models where drawdown is a natural um, expression of their technique as opposed to a symptom associated with something going pear shaped. So if you've got that level of confidence, for instance, you know, we all know about Paul Mulvaney's fantastic equity curve, but the time to invest in Paul Mulvaney is when he's in these deep drawdowns. And if you did manage to um, invest sums of money over the course of his, um, I think, 20 year history, or if we look at Dunn, if we look at Dunn over how many years have you got there, Niels? 40, 40 years or something like that? 47 in total, 37 for the current strategy, but yeah. Therefore, as an investor, um, who had a nice long life was saying, um, I've got this pool of money and over the course of time, I'm getting more money in. How do I want to allocate towards done? I'd be choosing your drawdowns as the perfect time to come into your program. Yeah, I mean, I can add a little bit of color, but of course, for regula regulatory purposes, I have to be a little bit careful. But what I can say is when I look at our original strategy that has the, the what we call the, the original level of leverage, because it's a high, quote unquote, a high leverage sort of strategy, we also, of course, expect larger drawdown that just comes with the territory. So for us, a drawdown of, of, of a meaningful drawdown, let's put it that way, is, is 25% or more, right? That's when it starts to say, okay, that's meaningful. Um, and, and to answer your question, actually, since 1984, there's been 11 of those drawdowns. So yeah, they, they do occur in terms of uh, average or sort of average length, they take about 12 months. And on average, they're around 35% if you put them all together, so to speak. But what's interesting, and this is what I think people or encourage people to do, is go and do the analysis what happens the following three years after a drawdown like that. Because the returns you, at least we've seen historically, and of course there's no past performance, is not a guide to future returns and all of that good stuff. But the returns you and this is not just unique for us, but I'm sure for for many of our peers, they're quite extraordinary, and they're not just like you know one x or two x. They're typically like three or four x of the drawdown the following three years. So it's it's very very interesting to uh, to as you say, as a good rule at least to add to your trend following investment when there is a meaningful drawdown, and if you're newer to the uh, to the space. Yes, if if you have if you're lucky enough to to be able to time it, but I would generally say if you if you want to get into it, just spread the in, initial investment out over you know a period of time, three months, six months, whatever it might be, just to make sure you don't sort of either are, are, are lucky or unlucky, so to speak. But yeah, no, I agree with I agree with that. It's it's um it's one of those. I mean, it it kind of reminds me of what Bill Dunn would always say when he was asked about these things. He would say that the best time to invest in a trend following strategy is at the bottom of a of a drawdown. The second best time is today. So as it goes to our the the uncertainty of of um, forecasting these things. Now let's dive into the other topics we want to discuss today, and and of course the theme of today, without without a doubt. Uh, is going to be focused on risk and risk management. Um, and of course, we've talked about this many times on the podcast that although people think of us as return-oriented, what we really are is risk-oriented because this is kind of where we start. And so before we get into that, I just want to say that on Wednesday, I will be releasing another episode that I recorded this week and I, I recorded it with Rob, and the guest is a uh, professor who's been on the show before, Professor Cam Harvey of Duke University. But what's super interesting about Cam is that he's also, for the last 15 plus years, been a strategic investment advisor to Man Group. So he knows his trend following. He's deep into the weeds uh, with this high-powered group of people. And uh, he recently published a book that I can highly recommend, which is called Strategic, Strategic Risk Management. And that's the book we're going to talk about. Um, but of course, because it came just, we, we had sat down just a few days after Black Friday, it, it, it may be even, even more relevant to, uh, to most people to listen to that conversation. So yeah, he shared some really valuable insights. I hope people will enjoy that when it comes out on Wednesday. Okay, here we go, Rich. I want to ask you if you can talk a little bit in the beginning, 
how you define risk, how you think about risk, maybe to put it into some kind of context. And then we dive into some of the points that you've found. Sure, Niels. So the way I tend to view risk, because I'm a very uncertain individual, um, I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, let alone a few weeks down the track. I have no ability to predict a future path. Um, I tend to adopt a different philosophy to the traditional way of defining risk. So when most traders define risk as um, a deviation from an expected performance return, in other words, they're using history as a basis to um, identify um, a return series or or the, the trend in a return series, and then the assumption is that that history can be extended into the future with a degree of certainty, and then risk can be quantified, therefore, by virtue of how much it deviates from that expected return or that projection from that historic return. Now, that is a way you can um, attempt to quantify risk, but I think it falls far short of how we should address risk, because I believe risk is far wider than the historic performance, because as we've discussed in prior podcasts, that is just one record of a sequence of events that's made up that history. And we know that if we flipped around or shuffled those sequence of events, we could have a totally different historic path. And when we look at where we are now into the future, we don't see a single extended future path to expected return from a wider perspective of viewing risk as a probability landscape of how you unite discrete events together and the impact that they have by virtue of how how they're ordered or sequentially arranged, that can produce a braided array of, of, of an infinite number of possible future paths. We can't ever assign any degree of certainty within this expected projection of an expected return. So in terms of um, how most people traditionally view risk when they try and quantify it by saying, um, let's look at the the standard deviation variation of outcomes around our expected return, and that gives us an indication of risk. We say, well, or I say, there's a bit of a, a predictive assumption in there in that you are assigning a degree of certainty into your expected future forecast. And this is more what I call model risk as opposed to, in other words, a risk associated with their modelling of where they believe expected returns are going to be because the actual outcomes significantly vary from that. Therefore, I say, well, that's model risk. It's not expected return. So therefore, I view risk as not only that which we can quantify. So let's assume that I view, yes, The historic path is something to take note of because it's important. It gives us a record of the sequence of events. Sure. But I say, but just be aware that the future may not replicate that historic past. And as we say in trend-following world, we say history might not repeat, but it may rhyme, which means that we don't rule out the possibility that history may be repeated. Yes, that is one possible path. However, it is more more likely from a probability perspective that um, the future is going to be different to what has been presented to us in the past. So therefore, we can't use this quantifiable measure of standard deviation around an expected return because we don't have an expected return. You notice that when a trend follower talks, they talk in terms of their price followers and they're not, um, they're not uh, price predictors. So in other words... Uh, we are risk managers, Um, we leave ourselves open to profit opportunity, but we don't know when that profit opportunity is going to arrive, where it's going to arrive, how it's going to arrive. We just know that there is a universal feature of these markets which produce these these occasional tail events which are nonlinear in nature. And provided we've got these, these systems that manage risk at all times by virtue of the system design, we let these float in the market and occasionally they're going to catch on to one of these significant 
nonlinear outliers. And it's a bit like throwing dry leaves into a storm where the leaves might be moving around, jostling around, but then suddenly the storm grabs it and it shoots off taking those leaves in a direction. That's a bit like how I view trend following. I don't view it as a method to, uh, in a predictive way, uh, like a, it's, it's a type of hunting technique which is setting a trap in the market for a particular condition to arrive and then being the opportunistic predator who takes advantage of that, a bit like a spider setting a web, as opposed to a cheetah examining a herd and then running out and killing that animal through his method of predicting where that animal is going to be at that particular point in time. We know this universal principle of the markets is that it has tailed behaviour at times. We set our spider webs in these zones where this tail behaviour occurs. We don't know when it's going to occur and we just sit back and sip our martinis on our hammocks as we wait for our spider webs to be filled up with prey. And usually that prey are the predictive guys, the guys who have a degree of predictive certainty around their, their estimate of expected returns, and they find that they're left wanting when the market decides, hey, we're not going to give you the opportunity to get your expected return because Mr. Market here is going to give you another little ride that you might have been totally unaware of. And, and that's where, so when we view risk as trend followers, we view it as um, the quantifiable risk, as the traditional risk takers often do, but we also include uh, the risk of uncertainty. So we break it down into two aspects of risk, certainty or risk that can be quantified um, using historic means as a basis to predict a, a quantifiable assessment of that, of what we call a, a knowable risk. And then there's the unknowable risk or the, uh, the risk associated with uncertainty. So there was a very good writer by the name of Knight Frank in 1921. He defined risk as comprising two forms. There's risk, which he assumes is, I'll just read what he said. He assumes there's perfect knowledge of future states of the world and their consequences and probabilities. And in this world, optimizations, fine tunings and precision work because probability distributions are largely known. So that's the risk bucket, the quantified, the precise, the accurate. And he says that um, in that particular domain, we can assign games of chance such as roulette, poker and other casino games that we know all of the possible outcomes of those games. Um, because we know all of the possible outcomes, we know the possible distributions that they can deliver and we can therefore predict with quite accurate probability, uh, what um, that game of chance is going to result in. But however, he also then says there's uncertainty, which are future states that are in consequences and probability that cannot be foreseen. And he says prediction fails because the error rate is very high and the data sets are very small. Because And this is where tail events abound and all of the risks we associate with uncertainty we can't put quantified measures on them because there are so few of these events, but they're so material in magnitude. We know they occur, but we can't assign any, any dollar amount to that risk that resides. So recognising that trend followers view risk much more widely than just what can be quantified, we therefore have this extreme degree of uncertainty about everything. And what we do as risk managers is we say, well, therefore, I'm not going to assign any confidence in my modelling, but what I am going to do with my systems is I'm going to apply system constraints that therefore protect any adverse risk event, known or unknown. So therefore, what I'll do with my trading system is I'll say, right, I'm not, a, a, I'm not necessarily going to be a buy and hold guy who tacitly assumes because of the history of the performance of the S&P 500 for the last 50 years and it's been going up at, say, 8% or whatever, I'm not going to assume that that's going to continue on in the future because there are no risk constraints bound in that assumption. That is an assumption based on a historic record. So as a predictive guy, you're almost assigning a degree of certainty to your predictive estimation. And you're thinking that that protects you from uncertainty, but it doesn't. The only thing that really protects you from uncertainty are risk constraints that are designed within your trading models. So we, for instance, have methods that cut losses short. 
have methods that restrict our bet size to very small amounts of money. These are effective design solutions that mitigate known risks and unknown risks. But our models always leave ourselves open for the bounty of the unpredictable outlier or the beneficial um, volatility, but we're always protecting ourselves against the adverse volatility. So uh, in our world, we experience what we can call, our worst case scenario is linear losses, a linear sequence of losses. Let's say if we're in a, a particular market regime that is unfavorable to our trend following models, and uh, we're not going to find that any of them cause extreme loss events, but they will cause these small midget bites continuously biting at us, these small linear losses or sequence of losses that slowly progressively build our drawdown if, if we continually get these consecutive losses. But it's not going to wipe us out. The only thing that will wipe us out is what we've referred to previously in our Black Monday, our Black Friday discussion and in our March 220 um, discussion is our assumption uh, of at the portfolio level that all of our, uh, our systems are uncorrelated or our return streams are uncorrelated. So that's where, you know how I was talking about these linear sequence of losses? When you get multiple markets all doing the same things, that linear sequence of losses for each of those markets adds up to a non-linear adverse event. So then at the portfolio level, we see non-linearity poke its head into our portfolio equity returns. And we don't like that because um, in our discussions on, on prior podcasts, when you get these adverse sharp big drawdowns, you know, that might decrease our capital by 50%, you've got to make up 100% to return back to where you were. This is this non-ergotic process in investment capital that is so important to us, this path dependence. So we take path dependence very seriously. We take our system designs very seriously, our portfolio management very seriously. Everything we do is centered around managing the risk of certainty and uncertainty, as opposed to a narrow, perhaps naive definition that risk is something that can be quantified because we know in a future of uncertainty, we don't know what's going to happen in two months' time. It may be disastrous for many traders. You know, I, I went back uh, and had a look at that good old 120-year uh, record of the Dow Jones Index, I think. Went back to 1925 and I just looked at a drawdown of 92%. And I thought, hmm. I said, I wonder how people would fare with a drawdown of 92% now. Because, you know, when I, when I on the Twitter sphere, when I see a, a, a drop of the S&P of 2%, there's enough of a furor on Twitter to keep you going for weeks. So that's a 2% drop. But imagine, imagine a 92% drop. Now, wouldn't that put, uh, you know, make you suddenly realize the benefits of perhaps trend following? And you know what? I mean, you talk about a study going back to 1920 or whenever it was for the Dow Jones, but we only need to go back 20 years to look at the Nasdaq. I mean, it was down 87%. I think that's close enough. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, I like that. I want to, I want to dig into, I just want to mention something that I came across someone mention and, but I, th and I think you're going to like it because you talk about, you know, trend follows. We recognize that our ability to predict outcomes in a complex adaptive system is pretty low. So here is a visual example of that that you uh, that you might want to uh, to use. I don't know. So if you are someone, say one, two, three, what comes next? Right. The answer is four. That's obvious. But then you could say, well, hang on, not so fast. I mean, it could be three because the best predictor of tomorrow is always today, or it could be two because in the end everything reverts to the mean. Or it could be one because everything that goes around comes around. I'm going to have to steal that from you. That is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I didn't come up with it. So there we are. But um, no, I mean, you correctly say, and this is important, that we don't know, we can't forecast returns. We, we, we completely, you know, admit to that. 
But there's one thing we can kind of forecast, and that's something we hang our hats on to some degree, right? And that is volatility. Volatility is a lot easier to forecast, right? But then, and this is something we spoke with with Cam Harvey, Rob and I, on about that people really need to pay attention to what he has to say about that. And it is this thing about, you know, the drawdown kind of thing. What 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 we what we should take into account in our model design is convexity or skew, essentially. Because people don't like that kind of negative skew type uh, profile. And so, uh, I mean, when you ask people, and I've certainly asked a lot of people over the years about, do you have any rule of thumb in terms of what the drawdown, expected drawdowns? One of the best ones I've heard, because it's relatively easy to remember for a trend following strategy is uh, something along the line where you would expect, say, four to six times your monthly volatility. So if your monthly standard deviation is five, you probably should expect somewhere between, call it 20 to 30% drawdowns. Um, and one thing I remember, this is kind of going off the tangent a little bit, but I remember, and I think this was 2013. So in 2013, you know, things were fine in the beginning of the year. And even in 2013, a lot of managers had pretty, you know, a few managers had a pretty long track record. So you kind of had an idea of what to expect in terms of drawdown. But I think in 2013, this is a little bit from memory, but I think in 2013, a lot of the established managers blew out their worst drawdown by 50%, even across track records that were like 20, 30 years at the time. And it just shows you the the the, the you know the difficult situation we are in when it comes to risk and why risk management is such a crucial part of what we do. It really is the core of what we do so to speak. So I just want to mention, um, I just want to mention that feel free to comment if you, if you want. No, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, look, the, the thing is, I, I think it was Bill Dryce on your episode a long time ago. who said, just be aware that your worst drawdown is always ahead of you. And, and I think the basis of that, there's, there's a couple of reasons. Firstly, there are going to be, um, future events that have never been seen in our historic record. So that therefore um, puts our systems into a different regime or a different environment that we don't have a back test to basically tell us what level of drawdown to expect in that future. So it could be worse. But the other thing is, as as we go further into the future, of course, our sample size increases. So our previous estimate of what our maximum drawdown might have been might just have been an assumption based on a, a smaller data sample. And so as we therefore go further into the future and our data sample increases, the ultimate drawdown uh, might be more larger than what we anticipate. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting what you say. Yeah. Now, um, and by the way, um, and I think uh, that's another point that um, I picked up on in our preparation for this, and that is, of course, that risk management, so to speak, it's really the I wouldn't say the only part, but it's certainly the major part of where we can exercise some level of control when it comes to building and designing our models. So uh, this is, of course, also why we spend a lot of time doing it. Now, the next point we want to talk about and, and where we want to, uh, I want to hear your views, um, something that comes up a lot. And of course, when you go through a period like uh, we saw last week, where the volatility increases, not just in the markets, but in most strategy returns, et cetera, et cetera, that can lead to a lot of uncomfortable sensation with investors. So tell me a little bit about this kind of relationship between volatility and risk and why we have to be careful as to how we think about them. Let's put it that way. Feel free to, uh, yes, so, Professor Brennan. <laughs> I, I hope this helps a bit. I, I suppose the natural assumption is that uh, when we've got a portfolio equity curve, the natural assumption is that the nice, smooth, linear, ascending equity curve has the lowest risk. Now, that is a 
that's a bit of a symptom associated with economic theory, particularly associated with Markowitz in 1952 with his paper, where um, he assigned uh, risk to something that, that can be measured by this variance about a mean or, or a deviation away from this expected return, as we've been talking about. So um, in terms of, uh, of Markowitz's um, understanding of the market, we've got to recognise that what Markowitz did was an amazing an achievement. And by the way, Niels, I love the podcast you had with um, Steve Forster. Yeah. That was very interesting, uh, looking at the history of uh, Markowitz and Bill Sharp and everything like that. But anyway, we've got to recognise and we've got to give credit for what they achieved because they achieved so much. And certainly the Markowitz assumptions that came out of there were very valid for a large portion of the data set. They accounted for about 95% or so of, of what, what the market data told us. So under these assumptions um, that Markowitz applied, his first assumption was that we can apply a normal distribution to our risk assessment and we can measure risk about a variance about a mean. So therefore, we need some notion of how to forecast an expected return and therefore how to measure then the variance around those mean, that mean. And therefore, if we knew the value of our expected return and we knew the degree of variance around that, there is an optimal point that can be found where we can maximise our expected return for any given level of risk. And in his terms, risk was this simple variance around this mean. And when we talk about volatility here or variance around the mean, we're just talking about um, the ability of price to go up or go down, how far it stretches and the degree of amplitude it has in its range. Now, what we as trend followers do is say, hold on, hold on. I said, uh, we're saying, we really like your ideas, Mr. Markowitz. However, in our particular technique, we are not predating on the alpha or the opportunity in the 95% that can be assigned to a normal distribution. We are targeting these outliers that exist in these tail regions of the market distribution of returns. And in that little domain that we focus on, you can't apply these little normal standard deviation tricks. You can't apply these normal distribution assumptions. And so there's, there's other things that define risk in our landscape. So volatility is only one component of risk. There is, for instance, we talk, uh, you talk about uh, volatility as far as stuff price going up and price going down. However, our particular trend following models, we actually benefit from that upside beneficial volatility. We just are concerned with the downside volatility. And in your assumption of your mean variance and, and your assumption of your, your um, utility of expected returns, you're assuming um, that um, upside volatility and downside volatility of your equity curve should be penalised because you're saying we want to strive for the smoothest degree of equity curve or the smoothest, most linear line with the less variation. But we say no. We say we beg to differ. We say because in these tail regions, we are focusing on the non-linearity that exists in those that volatility movement. And when you target that non-linearity and your losses are confined to just a linear sequence of losses, you get an extra kick from targeting that non-linearity as opposed to just trying to attempt the smoothest um, equity curve. We've got a volatile stepped equity curve that lifts up more than it, it goes down into drawdown. So in our, in our equity curve, we've got an equity curve that is very contingent on additional things to just uh, to, to volatility, we want to um, we want to reward beneficial volatility. We want to penalise adverse volatility. We want to reward path dependency and serial correlation in that equity curve. Because Mr. Markowitz, we're saying one thing you have failed to observe is that in your assumption of a normal distribution, you are assuming that there is no serial correlation in that equity curve. We beg to differ, Mr. Markowitz, because we find that serial correlation can be beneficial or adverse to our cause. There can be times of protracted mean reverting markets, uh, which cause our drawdowns to progressively get bigger and bigger and bigger because of the serial correlation that's present in that equity curve. 
Or we can get the positive benefits of serial correlation where we target these outliers and get this massive nonlinear kick-ups. So there are all of these additional factors in our world of trading the tails of the distribution of returns that we need to consider when we're assessing risk. Uh, it can't simply be defined by a variance around um, a, a, a mean of expected returns, and it can't be, you can't uh, apply a measure such as standard deviation to give us much information. So falling out of Markowitz's models, we, we started looking at the Sharpe ratio. This was the typical ratio adopted by industry, which basically, once again, was saying smooth is best. And so if smooth was best, then you would be rewarding uh, funds like long-term capital management and saying long-term capital management during the period of its, of its uh, great rise and rise and rise in the 90s where it had a sharp ratio, I believe, of 4.53 over that period of time, compared to someone like poor old Paul Mulvaney, who's got a sharp ratio of 0.5, you'd be saying, well, if the sharp ratio held weight as a risk metric, then it, how did we get this sudden collapse of LCCM at 4.35 sharp ratio? And yet Paul Mulvaney at 0.5 has produced his stellar track record, which has got this 100% you know, return over the last 12 months. So clearly there's something wrong with Markowitz's naive interpretation. Clearly there's something wrong with the sharp ratio's interpretation because the sharp ratio is just an assessment of the expected return less the risk-free rate. And then once you've got that level, that then you divide it by the standard deviation of, of, of returns. And so because the sharp ratio is not penalising benefit, well, what it's doing is it's treating beneficial volatility and adverse volatility the same. Well, therefore, it makes the 0.5 ratio that we achieve in trend following a nonsense. You know, what's the point of even saying what our sharp ratio is? Because the sharp ratio doesn't address the beneficial volatility in our equity curve. So that's the sharp ratio. And then you say, well, if we, if we decide to only consider adverse volatility, then we could go to the Sortino ratio as a better risk, risk adjusted metric. And then once again, we fall into this problem. Well, yeah, almost, but no cigar. Because uh, what about path dependency? There is no path dependency in the Sortino ratio. It just assumes that this variance exists or this ad, uh, adverse volatility exists, but it's not explicit about when it occurs over the time series of our equity curve. And we know that um, our equity curves are path dependent in nature. If we have significant drawdowns at the beginning of our equity curve, that compromises the compounding effect over the long term. So, um, you know, when these events occur over the course of time of the equity curve is very important to us. So we've ditched the Sharpe ratio, we've ditched the Sortino ratio. What else do we have? This is where we move to path-dependent metrics. And this is where um, they talk in terms of risk-adjusted returns. Well, we could use risk-adjusted returns for Sharpe if we defined risk as, as that quantifiable measure of standard deviation. But in our term, that makes no sense to us. So we talk about risk-adjusted returns in terms of path dependency and in terms of uh, the, uh, uh, the beneficial volatility, the adverse volatility, the path dependency. And therefore, we use metrics such as the Ma ratio or the serenity ratio, as you and I are familiar with, Niels, yep. as, a, as, a, as a method that really gives us this little edge in the compounded net wealth that's delivered by our system. So where do we go? We started with this nice straight equity curve. We've said to ourselves, well, these nice straight equity curves, we've seen that in L long-term capital management, and that doesn't necessarily mean they're risk-free. In fact, what we found is that long-term capital management used a predictive model that assumed that the risk was confound, confined within the thresholds of its model, and therefore it was able to apply significant leverage within that restricted domain, and provided that model stayed within that threshold, we got this magnificent rising equity curve that almost looked as though they'd, they'd got the secret source. However, they had forgot to recognise what happens when market regime conditions change and they go beyond the thresholds of the limitations of their predictive models. We suddenly get this massive, because they are also leveraged, this massive sequence of, of non-linear adverse returns. And, you know, when you get five, six, seven of them occurring in sequence, you go straight to risk of ruin. So that was risk. That was a risk event. 
We weren't seeing it in their models. It wasn't being expressed by the Sharp ratio. It wasn't being expressed by the Sortino ratio. So we need to always recognise that risks exists at all times the moment we place a trade on. And our risk as trend followers, um, we are prepared to risk the entire bet that we make. So in other words, there is no quantifiable measure of this risk we use. We are prepared to say that bet I've made, well, the worst case scenario is I lose all that money for that bet, that individual bet. Therefore, we've got to keep our bets small, Fair bets very small, but be prepared to sacrifice that entire amount because that entire amount includes what can be quantified and what is unquantified. But at least we provide a a stop of last resort with our models, always built into our models, which means that we can't, I won't say can't, because we can actually get these nonlinear adverse returns when markets become correlated, as I've talked about at the portfolio level. But at an individual trade level, we certainly manage all aspects of that risk landscape. So then we can say, well, that therefore means that volatility is not the same as risk. And we say, yes, correct. And so when, for instance, we look at equity curves of our trend following landscape, when we look at Dunn, when we look at Chesapeake, when we look at Mulvaney, when we look at all of the trend followers out there, we see that these equity curves are quite volatile in nature. Now, as David Drew says, well, that is actually a symptom of robustness. That is not a symptom of risk weakness. And the reason he says that is that... um, If we expect a nice linear ascending equity curve, the assumption is that the market regime that we are trading is always favourable to our cause. That's the only way we're going to get this progressive increase in an an equity curve. However, if market regimes become unfavourable to us, we must expect that they will not continue going up. I mean, you know, that's a bit like uh, believing in unicorns if you believe you can develop an equity curve that continues to rise in all possible regimes because we know that no trading system can navigate all market regimes. They've got to be selective. And when those market regimes change, the nature of the equity curve becomes volatile. So therefore, volatility is a natural expression of the... the, um, the different regimes that exist in a market. When you look at a long-term track record, such as uh, for Duns for 45 years, you see that volatility. That's a very healthy expression that it is able to navigate without risk of ruin a different, vast array of different market regimes. And that is a testament to robustness. It's a testament to the skill of the manager in being able to survive unfavourable regimes and blossom during favourable regimes but expect the volatility. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, you make a, a, a lot of really good points. I appreciate that. And again, just to reiterate, and I don't remember the exact quote from uh, from David Drews, but I think he was something along the line that, you know, higher volatility strategies are the most robust strategies, even though that to many people is completely counterintuitive. And from my conversation with Bill Dreis, I think um, what his words were something along the lines was he says, we need what we need to realize, (laughs) pardon the pond here, because what he's saying is that a trend following strategy, we realize the risk every single day, unlike most other strategies, right? Just, I mean, you you know, we can, the easiest example is something like private equity that does not realize risk for months or whatever however often they have to strike a nerve and that's you know not made up about their own uh, prices and all of that stuff but we mark to market every single day so our strategies will naturally look more volatile but i i really love the and i do think in some ways i mean not ju- not just on but but a few of the other you know, sort of legends in the in the industry and of course some of the newer ones as well i mean i think it is a testament that the strategy, the concept of trend following is incredibly robust when you think of all the weird stuff, you know, we've been through the last 47 years. Yes, it's been volatile, but, but you know, boy, has it been profitable as well. So, um, yeah, and no, I think th- this is, is very valid and I appreciate you uh, running through all of that. Uh, the last point I think we wanted to bring up uh, today, and I don't know whether you feel you've already done it, but but if not, let's let's do it, is, is, is this other concept that people need to, I think, embrace the understanding of at least, and that is convergence versus 
divergence because it's it didn't really show up in the conversation until I think really sort of uh, Alex Grayserman and Katie Kaminsky kind of uh, adopted those concepts in in some of their work. At least that's the first time I really came across it. Still, we don't hear a lot about it, but but it's really important to understand the difference uh, and how that plays into to our world. Yes, Niels. I, look, it certainly goes back to Alex and Katie, and their work on it was was quite an achievement. Um, it's it's specified in their book that the um, uh, trend following will manage futures. That's it. That's it. And um, so, what what it's talking about is um, the. There are two different philosophies in association with how to look at risk. There is the convergent risk taker and there is the divergent risk taker. And we've talked before about predictive mindsets and uh, a predictive mindset assumes a a knowledge of of a domain and therefore it assigns a, um, a probability to the expectation of receiving an outcome. Because they've got this certainty of this knowledge about it, they can apply a prediction to estimate, um, you know, where they're going to land in the future. So a, a convergent mindset adopts a predictive mindset. They view risk as something that can be quantified, so that fit well into the, what we've talked about in, in terms of measuring risk through these quantified measures of volatility and those sort of things. But they would uh, have a, a very narrow viewpoint of that domain of risk. They wouldn't be, for instance, aware of, of events that um, didn't reside in their domain of knowledge. Um, new events, things that hadn't occurred before, wouldn't exist in this domain of their, their understanding or knowledge. So they would assign that to uncertainty as opposed to where a divergent trader would assign that to risk. So the convergent trader would say that they typically are mean reverting traders because what they do is they say, the history pre- presents us with a track record that we can use as a basis to project into a future. And there is an assumption that in that historical record, there is a, a historic mean or an equilibrium, and the future price is going to oscillate about that historic equilibrium and continue on into the future. So that's a, there's a prediction in there. It's assuming that this behaviour is a backwards-looking mindset that says, look, go back to history, Let's determine what this equilibrium is and then wait till price gets to an extreme point away from that that equilibrium point. And we've got a pretty good predictive probability that uh, it's going to mean revert back to that equilibrium point. However, a divergent philosophy or a divergent risk taker is is someone who believes that uh, new things can happen. Risk is far wider than the landscape that a convergent mindset would have. And they are scaredy cats. So I'm a scaredy cat. And, and a lot of us in our trend following world, we, we view ourselves as scaredy cats simply because we, we cannot assign a degree of probability to any future event. Anything can happen in our world and therefore we've got to embed risk and mitigation mechanisms into our systems themselves as opposed to rely on predictive certainty as a gauge to assess what the future is going to deliver. So, you know, I don't have any confidence that the next 50 years is going to mean that the S&P 500 is going to continue to rise, but a lot of people are prepared to work around that principle, assume an equilibrium or assume a, a trajectory of that, and therefore they have something that they can project into the future to say, well, this is how risk is varied around this concept of this projection. So all it's really saying is that there are two, two philosophies we can classify. One is a convergent mindset, another is a divergent mindset. They have different appreciations of what risk is or the the domain of what risk is. I say, if you are going into an uncertain environment or a hostile regime, so let's assume that uh, you wake up in the morning, you go to work. Now, the environment that you've you've had over the last 20 years is quite predictable. You know where the chairs are in the office. You know where the car parks are. You know where all of these things are. You're adopting a convergent um, philosophy by using the history as a past to say that I know how to navigate to work tomorrow and there's going to be very few risk events in that sequence. However, that, that's a convergent mindset. But when the, the environment is foreign or new, so let's say we're now going out to a new planet in the solar system we've never discovered before, we've got no track record to rely on, uh, there's uncertainty embedded in the risk events that lie as soon as we land on that planet. They would have to adopt the divergent philosophy to address a much wider gambit of possible risk events to protect themselves for any, any 
opportunity to lose their, their, their investment capital or lose their lives or whatever their defining risk has been. But as trend followers, risk is, uh, uh, is the ability to lose investment capital. That's the easiest way to talk about risk for us. We don't talk about it as far as um, any quantifiable metric we can assign to it. It's just our ability to lose capital. And that, that means we can lose it through uh, quantifiable risk and we can lose it through unquantifiable risk. So that's how we deal with it. No, I, I think that's uh, absolutely true. By the way, people sometimes struggle with this, um, you know, what, what other examples of strategies where you can sort of clearly think about them as divergent and, and convert in strategies, right? So one strategy that relies on things staying the same, convergent strategies, and and strategies that relies on change, which is the, you know, divergent strategy. And, and I think two ex other examples would certainly be that in the convergent world, if you have some kind of long, short equity strategy where people want, you know, they, they sell the high flyer and they buy you know, something that's cheap in, in hoping that they might, you know, come closer together, for example, you know, if that's what they're doing, that could be, again, things that co go back to the mean or whatever it might be uh, and stays, you know, within a known territory. And no, an example of a, a divergent strategy that isn't trend following, for example, that would be um, sort of venture capital where you uh, where you buy maybe you invest in a hundred different small startups, having no idea which one's gonna be the next Facebook, but maybe one of them, like we do, hunting for outliers, one of them will be the Facebook, or will be the Snapchat or whatever they're called, and that gives you the payoff. But it's a completely kind of uncertain or we have no expectation of what, which one it will be. Another thing, of course, we've learned today, uh, Rich, thanks to you, is, of course, we've, we've heard about trend following being associated with animals like turtles and cockroaches, but now we can add spiders to the list. Um, so I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> Anyways, let me quickly run through some numbers as we normally do. Uh, so far in December, obviously only a couple of days, but December so far, slight positive as of Thursday. Now, Friday was, I think, a bad day for Trendfall or down day. But Beta 50 as of Thursday, up 31 basis points, up 9.6 for the year. SockGen CT Index up 20 basis points as of Thursday, up 5.93% for the year. Trend Index up 0.37 on Thursday, as of Thursday and up 9% for the year. And the short-term traders index up two basis points and uh, up just shy of 1% for the year. My trend barometer is having a week, continues the week period. So it, I wouldn't say it's predictive, it's not, but it has been weak for a while and performance is obviously suggesting that that's true. So the environment is still challenging uh, and it closed last night at 27 for the trend barometer. Equities, of course, um, also down a little bit so far, um, down 50 basis points so far for the world index, uh, up 14.7% for the year. And the world government bond index is up 32 basis points so far this year. Any final thoughts, Rich, that you can think of? No, Niels, I, I, I think I'm, uh, I'm just going to get further rehabilitation, put those band-aids on, fix the battleship up and get back out on the water. So uh, I'll let you know how it goes. Yeah, it's always a good strategy, and uh, and then hopefully, uh, hopefully the battleship will be uh, ready for our big joint conversation with Rob and Mark and Moritz and and Jerry coming up later this month. I might need a battleship uh, as mentioned. for that conversation, Niels. I think <laughs> it's going to be so much fun. Uh, we we certainly might need a little bit of protection, protective gear uh, as well. We'll see. But do send us your questions as soon as possible, info at toptradersonplug.com. Feel free to go and leave a rating and review if you uh, if you enjoy these conversations and make sure you follow uh, the podcast on your preferred podcast player uh, so that you get all the episodes directly to your phone. Next week, Rob is back to tell us about his experience on Black Friday, I think, and also tackle some of your questions uh, as well. So same email address, of course. For now, at least, Rich and me, we're going to sign off. Thanks so much for uh, listening to our conversation today. We look forward to being back with you next week. By the way, remember the Wednesday episode coming out uh, this week with Cam Harvey. You don't want to miss that one. Until next time, take care of yourself and take care of each other. 
Thanks for listening to the Systematic Investor Podcast Series. If you enjoy this series, go on over to iTunes and leave an honest rating and review. And be sure to listen to all the other episodes from Top Traders Unplugged. If you have questions about systematic investing, send us an email with the word question in the subject line to info at toptradersunplugged.com and we'll try to get it on the show. And remember, all the discussion that we have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their products before you make investment decisions. Thanks for spending some of your valuable time with us, and we'll see you on the next episode of The Systematic Investor.